The following program is sponsored by the Building Wisconsin Television Network. Welcome to Building Wisconsin. I'm Stuart Keith and on today's show, well, we're learning more about the safe installation of underground utilities and the process of directional boring in our state. So let's get started with Rob Call. Well, Rob, great to have you back on Building Wisconsin. And you know, as I'm traveling around the state, there's a fair bit of construction going on despite the times, especially underground utilities. Yeah, Stu, it's great to be here. And there is still a lot of activity going on. And in particular, underground utility, which is you know putting in fiber optic for internet, telephone, et cetera, is very active right now. And part of that is because of the state grants available, the federal grants available. COVID is really, highlighted for people that need to have high-speed internet available to be able to work from home and obviously for kids to be able to you know have school at home sure. and in a lot of parts of our state that's a challenge right now so the activity is there and I think it's just going to continue to in increase in the next year sure and along with all this underground work comes some concerns because there are some potential hazards laying just beneath the surface aren't there uh, there's a lot of hazards the way I try to explain it to people is take a plate throw a bunch of spaghetti on there and that's what it looks like underneath a lot of our streets, especially in the urban parts of the state. There's various lines, sewer, water, electrical, uh, fiber optic, other utilities. And when you're working underground, it's a blind atmosphere. You really can't see what you're doing. And so you really need to have trained people and people that have put the planning in place to get the work done safely. Yeah, and you bring up safely. Unfortunately, there have been some real tragedies, uh, both nationwide and locally here in Wisconsin. And do you think some of these tragedies could have been, or at least in the future, be averted with proper training? Yeah, so we're, we're actually in Sun Prairie where we had a, a, a tragic incident a couple of years ago that could have been avoided. You know, the, the, what happened there is the contractor that did the work decided that they didn't want to wait the three days that it would take to do the one call and get the proper siting done for Digger's hotline. So we had that incident happen and frankly, we're very fortunate it doesn't happen more often in the state. In 2018, the last time we had an audit, we had over 4,000 line strikes in the state. Oh my gosh, line strikes being directional and boring and you hit it something underground? Yes. <laughs> and, and we think it's actually more because Wisconsin, unlike Minnesota, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, et cetera, doesn't require uh, voluntary reporting. So this is just the stuff that we know about. In those other states, they have to report those in incidents and there has to be a state investigation. We don't have that in Wisconsin. We're, we're very unique and not in a good way. Well, that's very concerning to me as a resident of Wisconsin because this is public safety that we're talking about. Somebody you're saying could come in, not know what they're doing, strike a gas line and really not be liable for it? Well, think about this, Stu. They, a lot of the companies we're seeing do this work are coming from out of state. They fail to register to do business in the state, which is against the law. They are paying their employees cash. They're not properly trained. I mean, I'm looking at the street behind you here. People driving on that street have to have a license, right? Yep, sure. If you want to operate a forklift in a factory or on a construction site, you have to have a license. People that operate this underground directional boring equipment, they have to be 18 years old and that's about it. So they're digging blind underneath the ground. And again, think of that spaghetti on your plate with all those things going on that you can't see and the training's available, it's out there, but they're not required to get it. So the safety factor here is something that's very attainable, but we're missing out on it. And most people don't realize that there's not that licensure and training requirement. And so we're very fortunate we haven't had more major incidents when you have 4,000 strikes a year. Oh my gosh, that is just scary when you think about that. 
Now, what would you like to see happen? Is there some legislation that we could enact that would protect our communities here in the state? Well, first things first, you could just have the mandatory reporting that other states do. Right now, the penalties in place here in Sun Prairie, that contractor was fined $25,000 and told to take a $100 training course. He's done neither. Oh my god. And it's gosh. been a couple of years. And he's still in business? And he's still in business in the state of Wisconsin, oh even god. though he's not registered to do business in the state of Wisconsin. So that's the kind of atmosphere we're dealing with. The way I explain it to people is, if you rob 10 banks and you get caught once, and the penalty is just pay back the one time you got caught, why wouldn't you keep robbing banks? There's no teeth in our system right now. So we need to have an implementation of some standards, some training requirements, and some penalties if you uh, run afoul of the law. Now, people think that there are some permitting requirements, et cetera, when it comes to these underground utilities. There's not. Unlike public utilities, which have to file a rate plan, have to file a construction plan, get all these things approved by our Public Service Commission, there's no such thing for these fiber optic workers and these uh, companies. They have to get a permit from the local government to cross a right-of-way, or if it's in, work is in the public facilities area. But those permits don't list who's doing the work, who's responsible, and don't lay out, lay out detailed plans. So right now, it's a lot easier for these guys to do this kind of work. Underground, think of the spaghetti again. Sure. Do that fiber optic work and not have any oversight. It's easier for them to do that than somebody doing residential plumbing residential electrical work, et cetera. Think of when you build a new house. You have to get your plumbing approved by the inspector, the electrical approved by the inspector. You don't get an occupancy permit until the inspector signs off. None of that goes on when these guys are digging underground in your residential streets. That is absolutely insane to me. And let's quickly walk through the flow of a general underground project because the viewer out there might not understand that just because you pull a permit, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're the one who's doing the work. No, so the permit, let's say it's here in Sun Prairie, uh, they have enacted a law now where they do know who's doing the work because of the incident that happened. But in 99% of the communities in the state, uh, it's, the permit is pulled and it could be a company from Florida, Illinois, Minnesota that's doing the work. They don't list all the subcontractors doing the work. And frankly, the majority of the time, and I'm saying over 75% of the time, the people listed on the permit aren't actually doing any of the physical work, the actual drilling. It's subcontractors, and that was the case here, and it's the case, like I said, the majority of the time. It's people that the municipality has no idea who's out there doing the work. The plans submitted aren't detailed. Like I said, in Wisconsin, we really have no oversight and regulation on this industry. It's kind of the Wild West. Sure. Well, at the end of the day, with shows like ours, getting the public and hopefully our elected officials educated on this matter, we can make positive change. Well, that's the hope. I mean, right now there is a, a broadband task force that the governor's put together, bipartisan legislators on there and people from the industry. And this topic is starting to come up. It will be discussed because you can't just keep handing out grants. A lot of this work is done with state or federal dollars. That's money from us. And uh, you, know, you can't keep doing that with, without some regulation in place and without some safety standards. I told you before that last audit we had, there was 4,000 strikes throughout the state in 2018. The Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, the federal government entity that oversees this, found that our oversight and our regulation of the industry is inadequate. That could mean long-term less dollars flowing to our state unless we make improvements. And as we said at the beginning of our discussion, we need those dollars flowing in because we need high-speed internet throughout our state for people to work from home and get their education at home, especially during these times. Well, it sounds like to me, there's no excuse for not doing this type of work safely and really keeping our quality of life here in Wisconsin at a high level. That's all we're looking to do here. No one's looking to make anything onerous and have any oversight that is beyond what everybody expects to be done uh, to keep everybody safe. Well, I appreciate you coming on, shedding some light on the topic. Thank you. Hard work, sweat, knowledge in your own two hands. These are the tools that build Wisconsin. Leave your mark on the real world with zero debt and higher pay. All from day one. It's time to do work that works for you. Learn more at buildingwisconsintogether.com.
Well, Troy, beautiful fall day here in southern Wisconsin. There's some directional boring going on, and that's why we have you on today's show, because you're with KS Energies, and we want to learn more about how contractors in our state can safely learn to properly drill all these utilities that are going in the ground these days. Now, what is your role with KS Energy? I'm a senior area manager. I've been with the uh, company since it started with KS, and then 15 years when they were RB, so I've, I've, I've been around quite a while. I bet you've seen a lot in your day, both good and bad. M mostly good, some bad, but yes, you're correct. Sure, so at this location here, what is going on? We're actually directing or drilling a 4,000 foot main extension for a grain farm. There'll be laterals picking up on this section, you know, oh, for the customer. So the impetus so. for it was probably the farmer who needs to dry it, more cost effective with the natural gas line. And then the beauty of installing it is all his neighbors get to benefit because they have the option of tapping into it. Absolutely. You know, in a direction of drilling, there's less destruction on the property and the right of ways. Everyone's happy and sure. we move on. Well, that's one of the best things I like about directional boring. If it's done safely and correctly, it's really environmentally sound because when they're done, you can't even tell that they were there and the utilities are safely beneath the earth. Yeah, there's a lot that goes behind it. Just what you're seeing as far as the training goes getting the right safety equipment out here and the right equipment to make the job easy. Well, it's like so many walks of the construction industry, safety is paramount. And that training for this is actually done up at Coloma? That's correct, yep. We send quite a few apprentices up there each winter. And then we have our own training, you know, and yearly safety training. I mean, safety is the number one thing. And I think that's, you know, both you and I agree to that, that we want the guys to go home at night and they never stop training. And that training really comes into play, not only here, but I gotta believe in an urban setting, downtown Milwaukee or somewhere, where there's 100 years of infrastructure, it's gotta be really challenging to the safety side of this. That's correct. That's probably 60, 70% of our work is, you know, the downtown stuff. This is, we call these cookie cutters, we like them. You know, the good places to train younger guys. Sure. But once you get downtown in those more urban settings, it's, it gets challenging. But, you know, this takes more training and, and the safety part of it. That's the biggest factor. Sure. Do you ever run in on job sites to companies that are under-trained, not as trained as your guys? I mean, that's got to be scary. Unfortunately, we do. You know, and, and it is scary. We've had a couple incidents where we've actually had to stop them working and leave our job site in case something happened where you know we didn't want to be involved with it. Well, as a resident of the state of Wisconsin, I want these jobs done safely, right? Everybody wants to go home Absolutely. at night, and all the consumers want to utilize the services, but they they definitely don't want any accidents happening out in the field. So I appreciate you coming on today's show. Right now, I'm going to catch up with Josh to learn more about the safety side of the business. Thanks, Stu. It's been a pleasure. Well, Josh, great to have you on Building Wisconsin again. And last time we were together, we were up at Wrightstown, that 20-inch gas main. That was amazing seeing that one put in place. Yes, thanks for having me back, Stu. You're exactly right. That was a large steel transmission line that was being installed in Wrightstown. And now here we've got a 4-inch plastic main. And even though it's smaller and we're out in the country, is safety still paramount on a project like this? Absolutely it is, Stu. So we still have a lot of hazards out here, even in the country. We've got overhead power lines, we've got underground utilities, communication, even electric throughout this area. And then we also have the traffic and the equipment that's being used to install the products. Sure, and there's a lot of equipment that's on here. And a little bit later, I'm going to find out how all that operates. But let's walk through this specific project. Take us through what needs to get done to complete a job like this. Three days before we started the project, before we had anyone out here on site, we had to call Diggers Hotline. They come out, they locate all the facilities in the area. When our crews arrive on site those three days later, what they do is they look for those locates uh, within our running line and they take the time and expose those facilities. One of our practices here at KS is to ensure that those utilities are exposed before we end up crossing them. So with part of diggers hotline we have to stay 18 inches away from those facilities but part of our policy is we have to stay 24 inches away from those unexposed facilities so what we do is within the running line locations we go out we expose them so we know where those utilities are before we get our equipment close to them now I've heard the term potholing is that what you're talking about 
Yes, dude, that's exactly what we're talking about. Potholing can be done a couple different ways. It can be done either by hand with a hand shovel or it can be done with a, a vac truck or a vac wagon. And those things are pretty effective at finding the utilities that have been marked. Do you ever find things that haven't been marked down there and go, holy cow, I didn't know that was there? It's happened a time or two. Yeah, but you still have to always be cognizant of the hazards that are around. So once you've done some potholing, then what's the next step? After the potholing's done, then the crew starts to set up for the project, whether it's a directional drill or if it's an open cut. From there, they walk out the running line. They have a conversation with the crew on site and our directional drill team looking for any other hazards that may not have been found on the initial locate. At that point, they then start up the equipment and then they start to install the product. Sure, well, it seems to me that safety is job one with your company and it should be with all the companies that are doing this type of work. Wouldn't you agree with that? I agree, safety is first and foremost. Safety is all about family. That's our motto here at KS and we live by it every day. Well, Josh, I appreciate you coming on today's show. Hope to see you in the future. Right now, I'm gonna catch up with Ryan. I'm anxious to learn more about this equipment. Perfect, thank you, Stu, it was a pleasure. Ryan, great to have you on Building Wisconsin. You know, we're all curious how this drilling equipment operates, and so we want to learn more about that. But before we get into it, tell us a little bit about your background. What is your role here at KS Energy Services? I'm the drill manager for Southeastern Wisconsin. And you're an operating engineer? Correct, I've been an operator since I'm 19. I've been doing this type of work for about 15 years. Wow, so you're pretty experienced with this. Now, this is a rural setting. You ever been in the big city and see some of the different spaghetti type holes that you never know what you're going to uncover? Yes, I spent five years in Chicago doing work down there. Is that pretty challenging? Yep, it's a lot different than the rural areas. A lot more stuff underground. Sure, I bet there is. And again, on today's show, we want to learn how you're safely able to negotiate all those hazards that exist. So take us through the operation of this machine and how you can do that. This machine here is a 40 by 55. It pulls 40,000 pounds of pull pressure and 55,000 pounds of rotation. How they track the drill head, there's a locate box out front. The locate box reads the sawn down below. There's a sawn in the head. The sawn sends a signal to the locate box. The locate box sends a signal back to this driller. The driller and the locator are constant communication and see the same things, what's going on. And so the locator is the guy that's walking out in front and he's looking at the same screen essentially as the operator and on his screen he can see how deep it is, the direction it's going Correct. and that's really important because you need to avoid the different obstacles and utilities that are already there that have been hopefully properly marked. Correct. Now who actually controls whether it goes up, down, left or right? The driller on the rig. The locator out front has a clock on his screen and whatever way a guy out front, the locator, is telling the driller which way to drill, he'll tell him the drill, if he wants to go up 12 o'clock, he wants to go down at 6 o'clock. And then if he wants to keep going straight, he keeps drilling. Okay, I got a question for you. What happens if you hit, say, a large boulder? Say there's a 10-foot diameter boulder from the glacier under there. You certainly can't go right or left because you'll hit the other utilities. Well, then we go up or down. We try to either go over it or under it. And if we can't go over it or go under it, we'll pull it back and put a different drilling head on and we'll drill through the rocks. Oh wow, so no matter what you encounter, chances are you're really going to be able to get through it. Correct. Okay, so you're going through, we learned about potholing. Once you get to the end, does it pop to the surface then or what? That's how you steer it. If you want to come out and pop to the surface, you put the drill head at 12 and keep pushing out. Or there'll be a, a pit at the end. This, this instance we're going to drill to the surface, we're going to push 12 and come out of the ground and hook out into the pipe. Okay, so once you've gone the 540 feet here, then what's going to happen? You still have to get the gas pipe into the ground. So. In this instance, we're pulling a four inch pipe. So we're gonna take the drill head off and we're gonna put a reamer on and then we're gonna ream the hole and pull the pipe in at the same time. What the reamer does is makes the hole bigger for the pipe to pull through. Okay, so that reamer, that was that device I saw in the end and it had like little knobs on it there that, and that you're saying enlarges the hole to make it easier to pull that gas pipe? Yes, and as the reamer is reaming, we're using bore mud, which lubricates the hole and pulls the cuttings back to the rig. So again, I just love directional boring because it's so environmentally friendly. You're never even gonna know that we're here within a couple of days of you guys being done. Correct. How important is the training when you talk about being a directional borer? There's a lot of training. You gotta know numbers, you gotta know math to be able to do the percentages of going up and down and steering. 
and the training that Coloma provides for the drillers and the locators is an awesome class. Yeah, really, as I'm learning on today's show, there's, there's no reason a directional boring company shouldn't be as highly trained as you guys are because the opportunity is there. I mean, the training is there for any company that wants it. Correct. The other piece of equipment on site that really intrigued me was that hydrovac. Is that pretty nice to have on site? Yes, very nice. It's the safest way to locate a utility, saves the guys, and also it's non-destructive, so we can find the utilities with high pressure water and vacuum, so nothing gets wrecked as we're looking for utilities. A lot of times we come across things that aren't marked, and that keeps us from ripping them out of the ground. Sure, so again, then a company like KS and other companies in our state invest in this type of infrastructure, makes our quality of life all better in the state. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go up to Coloma right now, learn more about the training with Terry McGowan. I appreciate you coming on today's show. Thanks, Stu. Hard work, sweat, knowledge in your own two hands. These are the tools that build Wisconsin. Leave your mark on the real world with zero debt and higher pay. All from day one. It's time to do work that works for you. Learn more at buildingwisconsintogether.com. Well, Terry, a beautiful fall day, and it is awesome to be back here in Coloma at your training center. Looks like there is a lot of activity going on. It's good to have you back here, Stu. There are a lot of training going on. But right now, we've got apprentices that are here. It's late in the season, and what we're trying to show them is the type of training that's available to them in good weather. All of these operators are apprentices? They're apprentices that came up here to, to hone their skills and polish up on what equipment they've got a little bit of experience on. Well, they must be getting some good training because I've been here about a half an hour and admiring all the pieces of equipment working intricately amongst themselves. And you know, that brings to mind safety. And on today's show, we've been talking about safely installing underground utilities and avoiding the hazards that lay underneath. And we thought, let's get up here and show the general public the training that's available so there's really no excuse for a company not to be properly trained. That's right, you know, and, and this trenchless technology that's going on right now, whether it's open trench or trenchless, we teach them that the number one thing is utility location, because no matter where you dig, there's always a very strong possibility that there are buried utilities in that area. And in my mind, it's better to be practicing and learning here than out in the real world, your first job, like, hey, go dig a hole there or go run a directional bore where you might hit a gas line and, and have a tragedy happen, like unfortunately we've had happen recently. That's why this training is so important. I mean, these folks are training to work on a construction site, okay? There's construction workers that know how to watch, watch out for themselves and for their safety. These people are working with the general public. They're going through utilities through somebody's front yard. Yeah, and when we hear the term essential workers, yes, of course, the doctors, the nurses on the forefront, but not far behind are the operating engineers that are doing this type of work because, again, one mistake out there can lead to a catastrophe in any of our communities. That's the skill that's involved, Stu. I mean, these students are not only learning to be safe with each other, they're learning to be safe with the general public. Well, you know, fortunately today, I see a lot of marking on the ground. Does that mean that you're training them how to properly directional bore? We train them the different utilities, the different colors. Blue is water, red is power, orange is, is fiber optic, and of course, yellow is gas. Well, can we get into it and see what they're learning and maybe start with the hydro excavator? Let's take a look at that. Well, Terry, I gotta say, this is an incredible piece of equipment, and as I understand it, it's very valuable for locating utilities. It is. Like I said, Stu, the number one thing you do is you call for location. They line it up, they tell you exactly where the utility is, and then you come in with the Hydro Excavator. Our friends at Hydro X were good enough to work with our training program today to show our students exactly how you locate these utilities once they're marked. And walk us through how that works, because to me, it's amazingly clean. When I heard it was, you know, hydro being water, I was like, oh, there's gonna be mud, it's gonna be messy, but it's anything but that. It is not messy. They, they have made such an art out of these machines. 
What happens is they've got a very strong vacuum in this machine and they throw a jet of high pressure water into the dirt and they vacuum it up as they push the jet through the dirt. And that high pressure water is it, you know, this is sand, so it's easy to go through, but anything else? It will go through hard pan clay, Stu. Really? Yes, sir. And it's a safe way to expose them. You're not going to do any damage to the utilities. No down damage below? to the utilities, and you, you, you have a good view of what's down there. If you look down in there right now, you'll see a power line. Really? Yes. And again, here at Coloma, you can put all the different utilities that you might expect to encounter underneath, you know, whether it's a rural setting like this or, as Rob alluded to, spaghetti in an inner city. Yes. I mean, we've got water marked, we've got power, we've got gas, we've got telecommunications marked, and eventually what they're going to do is come through it with a directional drill machine. Would this piece of equipment be taking the place of what historically was done by hand? Absolutely. I mean, if, if you were working with an excavator coming through here, you'd have several guys down there with shovels trying to expose the utility and, it, and bucket it away with an excavator. This just comes in, we call it potholing. And it just potholes down to the utility. You get a clear view of it. You don't have a big hole exposed on the middle of your job. And it, it's just a very clean, very efficient way of doing it. Okay, this is a hydro excavator. Let's go down and learn more how they're trained on the directional drilling machine. Let's take a look at that. Well, Terry, it's great seeing this directional bore in action out on location earlier in the show. Now maybe you can take us through how these trainees are being trained to properly and safely use it in our communities. Well, we purchased this one recently. This is a very late model, and these students are getting the opportunity to see an actual late model directional drill being instructed by a professional who's been in the business for over 25 years. They learn how to run the slurry into the machine. They learn how to load rods, connect them, and then the most important job is the locator down on the end. He knows exactly where the tip of that drill is and at what elevation. Yeah, and as we learned on site, the communication between the locator and the engineer running the machine is crucial. It's crucial, especially as they're approaching the utilities that you saw potholed earlier. Everything that they might expect to encounter out on a real world setting, they're learning about here. They're learning about it. They're learning about, again, location, pothole, visual, and of course the man on the end who's got the locator. Yeah, and you know, throughout today's show, it amazes me when I hear the stories from the men and women out in the field, how there are companies that aren't trained to this level. And I question, why in our state are we allowing companies to not be trained to this level? Some of these fly-by-night companies are coming in with people that they actually trade themselves. Now, if you're a fly-by-night company, who's training you? The owner, the boss. And what do they teach you? They teach you how to cut corners. And that puts the general public in peril. But when you do it right, the general public can be at ease knowing that we have a program like this to train these people properly. So when they're working in your front yard, be assured they've been trained properly and they will watch out for not only their safety, but your safety also. Well said, my friend. There's no substitute for peace of mind. Terry, great again to be up here at Coloma. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for coming back, Stu. The preceding program was sponsored by the Building Wisconsin Television Network.